Hello and welcome to The Print. I'm Snehesh Alex Philip. As India and China disengaged from the southern banks of the Pangong So in February 2021, one picture that symbolized the tensions between the two sides was a thick black smoke in the icy cold heights of Rechenla as armored columns, that is tanks and armored personal carriers from both sides pulled back. Almost exactly a year later, there was a 64 kilometer long juggernaut of the mighty Russian tanks, armored fighting vehicles and support arms heading straight for Kyiv in Ukraine. Not an empty show of strength like a parade. The armored forces of the size never seen before were expected to smash through the flimsy defenses of the unprepared Ukrainian forces and install a friendly regime and finish the war off. However, the opposite happened. The Ukrainians, armed with shoulder-fired anti-tank weapons like the American Javelin, the new generation light anti-tank weapon, the n besides armed and small kamikaze drones, had a field day as they took out one Russian armor after another. Such has been the destruction of the mighty Russian armor that Putin's invasion has seen as the biggest tank slaughter that Europe has seen since World War II. Claims and counterclaims apart, if you look at open source data, it confirms loss of over 1,400 tanks. In addition, there are armored personal carriers, infantry combat vehicles, tracked artillery lost. Losses means destroyed, abandoned and captured. This is when there has hardly been any contact between the Russian and Ukrainian armor. Instead of solving the issue quickly, Russian tanks have become a humiliating military liability. And hence, three questions arise. One, is there a problem with Russian tanks or tactics? Second, does this mean that tanks have become expensive and a meat grinding liability in the modern battlefield, bristling with missiles, drones, mines and long range artillery? The third, what lessons can India draw from the greatest tank disaster since probably the Arab plus armor in the Six Day War of 1967? India has already launched Project Zorawa under which it plans to procure light tanks for the mountains. While earlier it was looking at the Russian sport light tanks, it has now decided to go the indigenous way. The army is looking at a light tank with a maximum weight of 25 tons with a margin of 10% with the same firepower as its regular tanks but also armed with artificial intelligence, integration of tactical surveillance drones to provide a high degree of situational awareness and loitering munition along with an active protection system. Besides a light tank, the army is also looking at acquiring 1700 indigenous FRCV that is the future ready combat vehicles which will serve as the future main battle tank, a project which has been pending for long. The FRCV project is a big focus area for the army, which believes that with Pakistan and China both having large tank formations, it would be suicidal to not focus on armor, even as they admit that tank battle may not be what was seen in the 1965 and the 1971 wars. The army plans to start inducting FRCV from 2030 onwards, even though the project is still in the decision stage and the army is still to decide what exactly it wants. The army is looking at the possibility of a turretless future tank that is integrated with its own drone swarms, artificial intelligence and anti-drone electronic warfare. Given that there are only seven years left to design, get government sanctions, select vendors, do trials and production after which more trials would be held, one really wonders how many years will the army overshoot its 2030 game plan for induction. With the Indian Army moving ahead with his armor plans, the Russian tank debacle is fraught with lessons for India which operates around 3,500 of three different types of tanks. Two of them, the T-90 and T-72, are of Russian origin and form the bulk of India's armored holdings. The third Arjun main battle tank or the MBT is indigenously designed and produced but in very limited numbers and can't be used in situations like we are facing in Eastern Ladakh. So what went wrong for the Russian tanks? Since its introduction by the British in 1916 during the World War I, tanks have played a dominant role in the ground battles. The tanks are primarily an offensive weapon which allows mobile armored lethality on the battlefield to enable ground forces maneuver into enemy territory. As far as the defensive role is concerned, it is meant to stand and haul the advance of an enemy tank into its own territory. So it was not surprising at all that the Russian moved in with their mighty tanks. 
Multiple analysts have pointed out that Moscow's assumptions about an easy victory to a lack of preparation, poor planning and forced employment has led to the Russian debacle. The prince spoke to multiple sources in the Indian Defense and Security Establishment to understand what went wrong for the mighty Russian armored columns. While there are a number of reasons, including the new age anti-tank weapon systems, besides the aerial menace of the loitering munitions, one thing is very clear. Russian military onslaught was poorly planned and executed. Rob Lee, a senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Research Institute's Eurasia program and a former Marine soldier notes that Russia's heavy tank losses can be explained by the employment mistakes, poor planning, preparation, insufficient infantry support and Ukrainian artillery. He underlines that the use of javelins and other light anti-tank systems in Ukraine has not demonstrated that the tank is obsolete any more than the Sagar anti-tank guided missile did in the 1973 war, a war which would force the Israelis to modify its tanks and war fighting strategy to cater to the new threat. Some experts like Philip Spison O'Brien, a professor of strategic studies at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, opine that Russia's botched invasion has illustrated the diminishing power of heavy and expensive military power. He goes on to say that tanks, fighter jets and warships, and I quote, are being pushed into obsolescence. However, many would disagree and point out that even while the Ukrainians have been successful in taking out a large amount of Russian armor, they themselves are using them mostly captured from the Russians to bolster the counter-offensive and seeking more from the Western nations. Tanks have shot to the top of Kyiv's wish list as Ukraine presses its gains against Russia amid the shocking Russian collapse last month. Ukrainians are seeking American-made M1 Abrams and the German-made Leopard tanks which both countries are unlikely to give. Russia began the onslaught thinking the war will be shot. To begin with, the Russians were completely ill-prepared for a protracted intense war. Just like the Western thought process, the Russians had imagined this war to be short and sweet. What it thought was that Zelensky regime would throw in their arms and surrender after Russia moved in about 300 aircraft close to the border with Ukraine and rolled down its famed armor. Just like in Rechenla, the Russian armor columns making their way into Ukraine was more for show of strength rather than any actual fighting. The big mistake the Russians made was unlike in a conventional tank maneuvers where tanks keep a distance of a couple of hundred meters from each other, in Ukraine the Russians rolled them down the road one after the another. All the Ukrainians had to do was take out the first and the last tank in the initial onslaught to cause utter confusion and mayhem for the Russian soldiers who got stuck. It also seems that the Russians had delayed the original dates for operations because of Winter Olympics being organized by China. Ukraine is a great terrain for the tank warfare given that the flat open surface but by the time the Russians moved in the snow had become loose and mixed with the dark soil which made it tough for the tanks to move in and hence they ended up hitting the roads in a concentrated manner. The Russians also made several other tactical blunders including failing to plan a combined arms operation, a concept which the Israelis brought in after the 1973 Arab-Israel war that would have entailed coordinated operations between air, ground and naval forces. The concept is now followed by almost all countries having big tag formations including India. Given the shortage in manpower that the Russian military faces, especially the infantry, it could not provide the required boots on the ground that any tank assault would need to establish total control of an area taken. This meant that the, while the tanks moved in, there was not much infantry or rifle battalions to back them up. Michael Kaufman, director of the Russian Studies program at CNA and a fellow at the Center for New American Security, brings out some startling numbers about the manpower shortage in the Russian army with him pointing out that many battalions actually have half the strength than what the Russians claim. The Russian support to the armored assaults with mechanized infantry, electronic warfare systems and air defense was found wanting and in many occasions missing. Lack of air defense and electronic warfare meant that the weaponized drones and loitering munitions had a green pass to spot and target Russian armor at will. Logistics for the armor was never catered for. Problem with secured communications also led to Russian soldiers to communicate with mobile phones vulnerable to Ukrainian and Western interception and thus giving away the location for counterattack. Another issue that the Russians did not really cater for was the logistics. Tanks are one of the most logistics intensive weapons for the army and need a constant supply of munitions, diesel and spares. 
The Russian tanks, which had moved faster than other arms into the Ukrainian territory, were left without any logistic support, with many stranded out in the cold. Most of the Russian tank forces sent into Ukraine, composed of the T-72 variants and some limited T-90s, both of which are powered by diesel engines. Russia also deployed a large number of the T-80 variants too, which are powered by the gas turbine engines. And without logistics in place, the tanks were stuck without fuel. Lee points out that as of end August of the 994 Russian tank losses documented by Oryx blog, a website that uses open source tools to count destroyed Russian equipment, at least 340 or 34% were abandoned. The figure jumps to 38% if damaged tanks are included, he said. This percentage was the highest during the first month of the war with 53% of Russia's recorded tank losses being abandoned. Lee argues that many of the tanks listed as destroyed were first abandoned by their crews and destroyed by the Ukrainian soldiers who either could not or choose not to capture them. And I quote, this means that as many as 50% of Russia's documented lost tanks may have been first abandoned by the crews. In other words, the tank themselves were not the problem. They were simply employed poorly, which led to high losses, he said. However, experts like Stephen Bryan argue that even if you put aside all these operational errors and problems, the truth is that Russia is fighting with notably old and outdated equipment, making tank survival difficult even if Russia's field commanders had done everything right and Russia's soldiers had been well trained. But the biggest threat to the tanks were weapons designed especially to take them down. Noting that most of the T-72 tanks Russia is using in Ukraine were produced in the 1970s and 1980s, meaning the average age is over 40 years, Brian says that despite the use of reactive armor, these tanks are vulnerable to man portable anti-tank weapons, especially weapons that have tandem warheads designed to defeat reactive armor and penetrate the tank's hull. As he says, since his introduction by the British in the 1916 during World War I, there has been a seesaw battle between the protection system in the tanks and the lethality of the weapons designed to defeat them. And this competition has continued ever since. So what is the world doing? To begin with, the US Marines, which is different from the regular US Army, is dumping its tank regiments to make light and more expeditionary Navy-centric war fighting role. In early 2020, the Marine Corps had 452 tanks at its disposal. By December 2020, 323 had been transferred to the Army. According to the Marine Corps Systems Command, the remaining tanks are scheduled to transfer by 2023, which includes tanks in overseas storage and aboard maritime pre-positioning ships. The US Army continues to put its trust in the Abrams main battle tank with the latest version under development. It is already in the process of integrating the Israeli Trophy Active Protection System to take down anti-tank weapon threats like Javelin, with the Abram tanks. Besides rapidly detecting, classifying and engaging threats such as recoilless rifles, anti-tank guided missiles, tank rounds and rocket propelled grenades, the Israeli system also gives a launch location which will allow the Abram tank crews to rapidly handle targets. The new version of the tanks have been designed to operate air and ground drones in the line of enemy fire or sending large robotic vehicles to clear tank ditches and breach obstacles. Moreover, the Abrams could use long-range, high-fidelity sensors to maneuver and target enemies in more dispersed formations. The Israelis have learned fast from the Azerbaijan-Armenia war and the Russia-Ukraine war and in 2023, the Israeli Defense Force, that's the IDF, plans to adopt the newest modified Merkava, their main battle tank, the Merkava Mark V, Barak. It will receive an improved version of the Trophy Active Protection System, which will be able to counter even the latest spike anti-tank missiles from Israel's own Rafael. Incidentally, Spike had won the bid against the American Javelin for an Indian Army contract, acquisition of which has been deferred in favor of an indigenous system. Connected to the tank's commander's helmet, the new Israeli tank will also have all-round video cameras that will provide images in daytime and night conditions. This will provide a full situational awareness for the crew. The tank will also come with electronic warfare that will have the ability to jam drones. The Israeli focus is on improving ergonomics and situational awareness for the crew besides jamming capability that would target drones. So, so say that the adoption of upgraded variant of the tank by the IDF clearly shows that Israel believes that the utility of tank continues even though it has to cater for the new challenges. The other big focus for the American and Israeli army are the robotic combat vehicles. This means that these vehicles would be manned by artificial intelligence and not by any humans. Israel's Elbit Systems in June this year unveiled one such vehicle that will go into testing next year. In the US, the Army is testing a fleet of next-generation combat vehicles as part of the US 
Army Futures Command Initiatives. Multiple Army Research and Development Labs, including the Army Artificial Intelligence Integration Center and the Combat Capabilities and Development Commands Armaments and the Ground Vehicle System Centers are involved in designing and experimenting new combat vehicles that can cater to the present and emerging threats. The US Army is also looking at equipping its combat vehicles with jammers that prevent drones from flying nearby besides cannons and machine guns for shooting down drones and launchers capable of deploying special drones that destroy other drones midair. So how does India see the role of the tank and the future? Sources in the Indian Defense Establishment who have been studying the Russia-Ukraine war closely say that there is no doubt that the mighty tanks have become vulnerable even as they point out that the flaw in Russian tactics. However, they point out that the Ukrainians are using the same tanks and armored fighting vehicles to reclaim areas from the Russians. So the utility of tanks cannot be ruled out, they say. However, the Ukrainians are seeking tanks because their drones coupled with better detection and long-range artillery like the HIMARS of the US have made the battlefield favorable for their tanks. This, the sources say, also proves that a combined arms formation is a way ahead. Sources point out to the fact that while tanks have reactive armor to protect itself from the size, the top-down attack is what hits them hard. The top or the turret is the softest spot of the tank, ATGMs like the American Javelin or for that matter the loitering munitions and drones carry a top-down attack and they are the, the new menace. The T-72 tanks of the Russian army have faced maximum casualties. As the name suggests, it's a tank designed in the 1970s and is falling prey to anti-tank systems and loitering munitions developed in the 21st century. In this race, the anti-tank systems have evolved but the tank itself has not evolved at the same pace or more. There was also a huge generation gap between the Russian tanks and the Javelin missiles or the aerial threat. The problem for India is that 95% of its tank fleet is Russian and it has both the T-72s and the T-90s. Pictures and videos of blown out Russian tanks in Ukraine with a turret flying off in air have led to the Indian Army looking at possible solutions and design flaws. Sources explained that the Russian tanks used by both Russia and India have a design flaw when it comes to the ammunition storage. It is located near the gun system and stored around an automatic loader. When the tank is hit from the top, the ammunition literally cooks off, blowing up the turret in the air and causing a painful death for the crew. The T-72s and the T-90s that India operates were built for the war of yesterday. While tanks are still relevant and useful, it needs to evolve to face current and future threats or risk being extinct. The Indian Defense Establishment feels that tanks are now facing formidable challenges. However, its utility is not gone. They argue that tanks will have to evolve and fight the present and future threats. Former Northern Army Commander Lieutenant General D.S. Hudda agrees that tanks will have to undergo design and there needs to be a rethink on the whole concept of how armor will be used and how we can integrate them with other arms. He says that tanks, even light tanks, will have very less utility in areas like Ladakh, which are made up of passes. This is because given that the narrow passes tanks will have to traverse in case of a conflict, a single ATGM can stop the movement of a full regiment of tanks. Colonel Vivek Chadda, a research fellow at the Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis and retired infantry officer says it is wrong to assume that armor is redundant. He argues that the bigger question is what kind of war do we envisage and how the armor is to be deployed. He said this is not only holds ground for just the armor but all weapon systems. Colonel Chadda says that the armor design and capabilities will have to undergo changes but its relevance will continue. Lieutenant General Rakesh Sharma, the Distinguished Fellow at the Vivekananda Foundation and former co-commander of the Lay Base 14 Corps, is of the opinion that India should not go in for light tanks meant for Ladakh, which he says offer limited space for tank warfare. He opines that one has to rethink the concept of victory. Will, and I quote, will there be another capture Dhaka kind of an operation? No. Will the Chinese be able to roll down the tanks to Lay? No. Would we be able to roll down our tanks into China? No. The same holds true for Pakistan too, he said. He argues that even against Pakistan, the terrain is not what it used to be in the 1970s. From Chanab down to Anubgad near Ganganagar, the build-up has become so thick, one will have to use a barrage of artillery hitting the cities to flatten them to make the tanks move forward. It is not what it was 30 years ago, he said. Lieutenant General Sharma says the tanks have become a more defensive option for India rather than an offensive. Chinese are the world's largest exporter of drones in the world, which includes the arm variant. Pakistan Army has also started investing in armed drones and have bought several from the Chinese besides those from Turkey, which have caused havoc for the Russians.
Major General Yash Moore, a mechanized infantry officer, believes that while tanks are vulnerable, it is too early to write it off. The debate on the relevance of tanks is three decades old. It was natural for the Russian equipment to take a beating because of the superior technology of the NATO, which includes Javelin and the n law, he said, adding that Russia employed poor tactics, planning and season to launch an attack. He said that the tank is the only formidable weapon that can provide support to the infantry as they close in. The armor tactics will obviously have to change. You will have to have eyes and ears ahead, he said, explaining the use of both drones and countered drones. Former Director General of Military Operation, Lieutenant General Vinod Bhatia, opines that it is too early to draw conclusions from the Russia-Ukraine conflict and says that we will have to see everything from the Indian context. We need to have the deterrence capability and look at the war fighting capabilities of us and the other side on the western and northern borders. The psychological impact that a tank brings cannot be written away. Of course, new threat means adaptation, he said. He argued that India has to ensure peace through preparedness. And he says the Russian environment is different and their aims and objectives are different too. We have to see the Indian scenario. War fighting is the last step. Before that, there are multiple steps, including political, economic and diplomatic. Military step is also having the deterrence capability, he said. So while the army focuses on long-term projects, what happens to the existing armored elements? As reported by the print, the mechanized infantry is already in the process of upgrading its Russian origin armored infantry combat vehicles, the same that met their death in Ukraine. Just like the new Israeli tanks, the Indian armored personal carriers have been fitted with see-through armor and specialized munitions to take down drones besides changes in its gun system. As per the plan, this specialized ammunition will explode in the air to bring down drones rather than going for a direct hit to counter possible swarms. But remember that these are all in planning stage. Many of these new capabilities, including those that give better situational awareness and counter drone measures, should be incorporated in the T-72s and T-90s as well. The Armored Corps is also looking at an active protection system that can jam drones, besides investing in drones that can give it beyond visual range awareness and attack capability. The need of the R is for the armored columns to have manned and manned teaming capability that will ensure a good mix of defensive and offensive capability. This would mean that the armored columns will have to devise new war doctrines and change in tactics. Drones are going to be the biggest menace that the tanks will face and it will be prudent to prepare now rather than think of 2020. While the different upgrade of the existing tanks are still being discussed, steps have already been taken towards manned and manned teaming capabilities. The army inducted its first set of swarm drones into the Armored Corps besides the mechanized infantry in August this year. The AI-based automatic target recognition feature in swarm drones enable these aerial vehicles to automatically recognize targets like tanks, guns, vehicles and humans while relaying back information to the control station screen. The army is also looking at more complex swarm drones than the ones bought as they are needed for providing tactical commanders with a force multiplier capable of providing surveillance inputs, undertaking close recce of a particular area to confirm inputs received from other ISR resources, while also having the ability to engage varied targets, including artillery and air defense equipment, enemy command and control centers, besides, of course, the armored vehicles. This is Snesh Alex Philip for the print. Do subscribe to our Prince YouTube channel for more such videos.